what is in there? Why was this French pirate buried in this Scottish graveyard with full honours even though we were at war? Welcome to Scotland Unplugged and the unwritable story of Francois Thoreau. Pirates, smugglers, privateers, buccaneers, they have a sort of timeless allure. Take a trawl through any child's bookshelf and I guarantee you'll find somebody in a stripy t-shirt with a parrot and a life-changing injury. But why are pirates so popular? Because they are. Sorry. But now we've got that out of the way, let's crack on. So you take the road that goes from Port William to Whithorn. You drive through Monreath, take a right-hand turn, drive down a single track path over a wonky looking cattle grid, past the memorial to Gavin Maxwell, the writer, and you'll find my favourite place in the world. This is St Medan's. Even on the grey days, it's pretty spectacular. And overlooking the waves is the abandoned churchyard at Kirk Maiden. A place with some interesting gravestones. Some of them have symbols on them for what the person did in life, maybe occupation, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I think these days you probably need Dan Brown to work it out for you. But they're pretty cool. The whole place is bursting with myths and legends. It's named for St Medan who, depending on who you listen to, was either a man or a woman, was either from Ireland or Cornwall or somewhere over there and arrived on a rock with her nuns. I'm not sure that's strictly legit. The old chapel was originally built for the McCulloch family of the House of Merton. The pulpit and the bell were taken away during the Reformation to be used in a Presbyterian kirk. Legend has it that the ship sailed out into Loose Bay on a calm day, at which point a storm blew up and sunk her with all hands. To this day, the story goes that if one of the descendants of the House of Merton dies, you can still hear the bell chiming from the icy depths. But this place is quite spooky in the dark. I did once run down here in the middle of the night with my sister, and I would say it's probably the only time I've ever beaten her in a race. As amazing as the myths and the legends and the view and the piratey gravestones are, for me, it's kind of the true stories that get most interesting is when you dig a little bit deeper. There's one grave in particular that always had me wondering. This is the last resting place of Francois Thoreau, French merchant captain, smuggler and privateer. His body was washed up on the shores of Monreath Beach just over there after a battle on the 28th of February 1760 and he was buried in this cemetery by the local laird, William Maxwell, with full military honours. But why? I think the answer might be somewhere over there, but we'll get to that. First of all, who was he? He was born in 1727 in Rue Saint-Georges, near Dijon in eastern France. He's thought to have been the grandson of a Captain O'Farrell who served in the Irish Brigade of the French Army. He had a fairly strict Jesuit education and was originally apprenticed to be a surgeon. But, like a lot of teenagers, he decided to rebel. After his father died, he came up with a grand plan to solve the family's financial woes by pawning the silver in his aunt's house. Which might have been okay if the silver had actually belonged to his aunt. In order to keep out of the way of the angry town councillor who did actually own the shiny stuff, Francois did the only sensible thing he could and ran off to sea. 
He joined the crew of a privateer as a ship surgeon, which would have been a pretty rough gig in those days. Privateer is kind of a strange word in this context in that it can refer to a ship or the person that actually runs the ship or someone on the ship. But these guys were basically private sailors slash mercenaries slash pirates. So they were given free reign to raid the ships of anyone who the French or the English or whoever didn't like that particular week. Unfortunately, on his first voyage, his ship was actually captured by the Brits and Thoreau spent quite a bit of time residing at His Majesty's pleasure. He wasn't going to let that get him down though. He used the time wisely, building his English skills to the point where some people actually thought he was North British, which at the time was kind of code for, well they didn't like to say the S word because it was shortly after the Battle of Culloden. Being a privateer, he wasn't actually eligible for any kind of prisoner swap, so he had to be a little bit more resourceful than that. While he was being helped aboard a prison hulk at Dover, he gave his captors the slip, stole a small boat, sailed that across the channel, and then joined another ship as an ordinary sailor and began working his way up. By the time he was 20, he made captain and was operating out of Dunkirk. And his reputation grew over the years, firstly as a privateer. One account has him capturing as many as 60 British ships in a year. Then, between the wars, as a merchant seaman and a smuggler. At one point, his cargo ship, the Argonaut, was impounded by the British, who couldn't find anything being smuggled. But they were so suspicious, they held on to it for two years just in case. Thoreau was involved in multiple battles up and down the Scottish, Irish and English coasts, and even as far away as the Baltic, where he happily raided trading ships. And he wasn't raiding ships and fighting battles, he was quite the social butterfly. He was even a protégé of Madame de Pompadour, patron of the arts, mistress of the French king, and yes, inventor of the Pompadour. You're welcome, John Lennon. Eventually, the French decided to take advantage of his reputation in Ireland. Remember, his granddad was an Irish captain, and the fact that he was a Jesuit, and the potential for sympathy from Irish Catholics who, let's face it, didn't like the Brits very much. This was the height of the Seven Years' War, with France, Britain, and each of their gangs made up of the most powerful countries in Europe, involved in a fight for global supremacy, a sort of Eurocentric global royal rumble. By 1759, the French, fed up with the whole sorry affair, had decided the best option was to take Britain out of the war by just invading the UK. Their best strategy, they thought, was a bit of misdirection. Step forward, Charles Edward Louis John Sylvester Maria Casimir Stuart, known at the time as the Young Pretender, and these days as Bonnie Prince Charlie. Heir to the Stuart dynasty, professional coward, and the face that launched a thousand shortbread tins. After his defeat at Culloden in 1746, he was living in exile. He was called to a meeting with the French high command, but turned up drunk and belligerent. It was suggested that Thoreau could transport him to Scotland, but Charlie didn't like that idea. Maybe they could send a lookalike instead. So the French decided to hold a Jacobite rebellion, without the actual jack bit. At the same time, they would support an uprising of Irish Catholics in Ireland, which was where Thoreau came in. With all this going on and everything kicking off, the theory went that the Brits would be so distracted they wouldn't know where to start. What could possibly go wrong? They sent him out of Dunkirk with a squadron of six ships and 1,300 troops. He headed north to Scandinavia to avoid the British fleet and wait out the worst of the winter storms. But they sailed to Ireland with the intention of landing his ships and beginning his uprising. He wasn't exactly glued to rolling news, so he had no way of knowing that the French fleet had been defeated. He was a lone wolf, a Norman no mates, but he had no idea. And then a storm blew up, leaving him with only three ships. He hightailed it north again to the Outer Hebrides to try and raid some supplies. His troops were so hungry, when they landed on Islay, they were digging up spuds with their bayonets. Once they'd stocked up, they sailed for Belfast Loch, where on the 21st of February he landed 600 troops and took the garrison at Carrick Fergus. But that didn't last. The British troops inevitably moved in. 
The French thought Thoreau could count on the support of the locals because of his granddad connections. That didn't materialise. Thoreau decided it was probably strategically best to leg it, and as his ships, the Belle Isle, the Blonde and the Terpeshore blew out into the Irish Sea on the 28th of February 1760, three ships, the Aeolus, the Pallas and the Brilliant were there to meet him under the command of Captain John Elliot. Outgunned, fighting off the Mull of Galloway, Thoreau sailed south to the Isle of Man to avoid getting trapped in the mouth of the bay. Thoreau put up a brave fight for half an hour and at one point even tried to grapple the Aeolus and board his 600 remaining troops. But in the last broadside of the battle, he was killed by musket fire. As death's goal, that is pretty spectacular. He finally washed up here on the shores of Monreith Beach, either wrapped in a carpet from his cabin or dressed as an ordinary sailor. He was so popular, there were news reports of his death. People even mourned him in England. There were even rumours of him having a wife on board. Some reports at the time said that when his crew surrendered and the troops boarded his ship, they found a young woman from Paddington who'd accompanied him on his adventures. The local laird, Sir William Maxwell, the third baronet of Monreith, was a big fan and had him buried here with full honours, despite the fact they were supposedly at war. Is there more to it than that though? Maybe the real truth is over there behind me. Round the bay from the church, on the other side of a prehistoric fort, you'll find a place called Callie's Port. Local tradition has it that it was the haunt of a smuggler named Callie, although it could be a corruption of the Gallic word Cala, which translates very roughly as safe landing place. You can see the rock formations do allow for boats to land pretty safely. And that's not an accident. Before 1780, there weren't any real roads in the area, so everything had to be landed by boat. These rocks have all been moved by hand at low tide. The farm's called the Knock, which translates as the hill. 360 acres of rocky outcrop with a view of Scotland, England, Ireland and the Isle of Man. It's also the farm I grew up on. The old farmhouse on the hill was abandoned in 1957, after someone died without leaving a will. Kind of ashamed to see it like this, but it's really all I've ever known. As with a lot of things in life, it's what's on the inside that counts. Believe me. And it's the strangest farm design you've ever seen. For the benefit of those of us not of a slack-jawed yokel disposition, the steading or the agricultural buildings are all at the front. And that's not what you do when you're building a farm. For starters, you can't see who's going up and down the road, which you kind of want to do in the 18th century because sheep rustling. It's not very secure. Second off, the house is built on the edge of a small cliff. You can't see it very well now because the walls have fallen in and filled the void. But why would you build a house on the edge of a cliff? It's a rubbish farm design, but it's a perfect vantage point. My family lived there years ago and growing up I always heard rumours about a tunnel which seemed kind of daft and maybe a bit far-fetched until the floor started falling in. There's an archway that disappears under the house and no one has any idea where it goes. We went in there after asking for permission from the current owner and it turned out you can just walk across the stones now. There's an entrance to something that seems to have been blocked off with concrete and stone. It just sort of disappears into the hillside. The strangest thing is that the archway is made of some kind of wood that's riddled with holes. What on earth is in there? There are things like that all around the Galloway coast. On the next farm along there was a vaulted cellar they only found when a tractor sunk into it. And all of this stuff was used for one thing, smuggling. Tea, silk, brandy, whatever you could get past customs and excise meant a big tax saving and a cheeky profit. And this place is right next to the Isle of Man which in 1760 is basically a service station on the way to Ireland world beyond. Just along the coast you'll find the tiny fishing village of Port William. It was built in the 1770s. It looks like it grew organically, doesn't it? It's actually a planned village. In fact, everything you've seen so far, the holes in the ground, the natural harbour, the house on the hill, the crazy chapel, all of it was owned by one man. 
Sir William Maxwell. Maxwell did like to live large. There's an account of him turning up to campaign at a local election with a horse-drawn carriage, the first wheeled vehicle in the area. Which sounds a bit insane, given that the wheel had been used for at least 5,000 years everywhere else. But remember, there were no roads. He had to have it delivered by ship. Then he had to get the gates on his estate widened so the thing could be driven through, specifically for this one occasion. When he turned up, he was shouted down by the opposition for his corruption and the amount of money he was making from smuggling. The implication was that he'd built the port to keep the customs people happy. In the meantime, he used the rest of his properties to hide the contraband. Was this guy a full-on eastbound and down bootlegger? If there always Bo the Bandit Darvel, was Maxwell big enus? And have I watched Smokey and the Bandit too many times? I actually have a description of him here from the writer James Boswell, who met him sometime in the 1770s. Formerly a genteel, pretty looking man. Now he looks like an overgrown drover. He entertained us with many of the exploits of his youth, which, however, were rather a little too marvellous. Were Maxwell and Thoreau cut from the same cloth? Or did Maxwell just like to think they were? Or is there another explanation? Some of his relatives were notorious Jacobite sympathisers, with one of them in particular, William Maxwell, the fifth Earl of Nithsdale, famously making an escape from the Tower of London, dressed as his wife's maid. Was our William Maxwell a Jacobite sympathiser as well? Answers on a postcard. I'd like to think I've learned a bit from making this video. It's amazing the history that's right under your nose. It's amazing no matter where I go, home is still my favourite place. And it's amazing how good the combination of tea and cooking brandy actually is. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. See you next time.